appreciate them so very much. All right. Uh, if you have your Bible, I invite your attention to the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament. Prophet Isaiah, chapter number 6. As our theme this year has been refocusing our vision, I'd like this morning to be able to have us to refocus our vision of the Lord. Isaiah chapter number 6. We'll be reading verses 1 through 8. Isaiah chapter number 6. Song of Solomon, Isaiah, if you've gone to Jeremiah, you've gone just a bit too far. Isaiah chapter number 6, and we begin reading there in verse number 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Father, we thank you for your word today, and pray now, Lord, that you will work your will and way, praying, Lord, that we may refocus our vision on the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is, and his greatness. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to use the image to be able to see who we are compared to who Christ is, to humble ourselves before you, to prepare ourselves for the service of the Lord. Our Father, we ask and we pray this now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. The title of the message this morning, Getting the Picture. I want you to get a picture today. A picture of Christ and who he is. Remember the Polaroid camera? You remember the Polaroid camera? I remember the Polaroid camera. These young people, they don't know anything about Polaroid cameras because they always have a camera. Wherever they go, it's on their phone. I have one on mine. The Polaroid camera was an interesting camera. It was the camera that spit out the picture from the slot, and the picture would develop while you held it in your hand. The negative would come out blank, and then a few minutes, the picture would start to come into focus. At first, it would be blurred, and you don't exactly know what the image is, and then it would become crystal clear. still have a Polaroid picture of my dog when I grew up in my teenage years, our Basset Hound Beauregard. Hold him in high regard and esteem. And in time, though, the picture would begin also to fade. As pictures tend to yellow and tend to fade. 
As we walk with the Lord, we start with a step of faith of trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And what we truly know about the Lord would fill a thimble when we are first saved. You remember thimbles. We don't know a lot about the Lord. We knew he could save us. That's why we put our faith and trust in him. But we didn't know a lot about who he is and what he's done and things like that. But as we walk with the Lord, as we grow in our faith, that picture begins to fill in of who the Lord is, how great he is, what he can do for us by his grace. And the picture starts to become clearer. But in time, though, as we walk in this world, the picture of the Lord that we have in our heart and our life will begin to fade. With the filth of the world and the filth of sin. We tend to lose our focus of what we know of who Christ is. So we need to be able to refocus our vision on the Lord and who he truly is and who we are. And how we respond to this picture of the Lord that here Isaiah gives us. We notice, first of all, there in verse number one, the time period of this vision was at the death of King Uzziah, the king of Judah. A king that was struck with leprosy for most of his rule in Judah. And the year that he died... Isaiah says, I also saw the Lord and saw his reach. Isaiah saw the Lord on his throne. First of all, there in verse 1. Showing the sovereignty of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. For he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. No one has power in this world except it were allowed him by the Lord. In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, in verse number 16, we see here again the Apostle John giving us a picture of the risen Lord. As he has come to rule and reign and to conquer on a white horse. Coming to judge and make war. His eyes a flame of fire, his head, on his head were many crowns. And he had a name that was written that no man knew but he himself. There in verse number 12. The description goes on. And there in verse number 16, the Bible says there, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Christ is king of this world. God is the sovereign in control of all things. Including what's going to happen in November. Including what will happen to the future of our lives and our country. God already knows the end from the beginning. And he is in control. He is seated on his throne. Ruling the nations of the world. And the universe. Uzziah had died. All the kings of Israel and Judah had died. 
before and after Uzziah. But we find that the Lord is everlasting and ever living, and that he is king. The Lord that Isaiah saw on the throne was the preeminent appearance of our Lord, a pre incarnate appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word there, Lord, in verse number one is the word Adonai, which speaks of Christ. In John chapter 12, Christ speaks there. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 12, in verse number 41. These things said Isaiah, or Isaiah, when he saw his glory and spake of him. Speaking of Christ, here in chapter 6 of Isaiah. We need to see the Lord, the eternal monarch sitting upon his throne, a throne of glory, before which we worship him. A throne of government under which we as his children must be subject. And also as a throne of grace to which we as his children can come boldly to, the Bible says, at any time. We notice this throne is high and lifted up there, it says in verse number one. The picture of the Lord seated upon his throne, high and lifted up. The Lord is not a man like we are men. He is the God-man. 100% God, 100% man is our Lord Jesus Christ. And the thing we tend to forget is that he's 100% God. That's the thing we tend to forget. Because we can't relate. But he is God. He is high and lifted up. He sits above all other thrones of this world. Our Lord is above all principalities and powers of this world. There is no government that can claim to be equal with God. There is no ruler that can claim he is God. There is none that can defeat God. Can defeat the Lord. And in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 through verse 18, we see why. This is true. The Apostle Paul, writing, is moved by the Holy Spirit of God, speaking in Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 15, speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 1 and verse number 15. who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. There is no principality or power that can defeat the Lord because he created them. All things were created by him and for him. 
And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Is the Lord preeminent in your life? Is he first? Is he on the throne of your heart, high and lifted up? After his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ ascended back to heaven to sit upon his throne at the right hand of the Father. John 17 and verse 5. Where he sat before he came to this earth to die for our sins. He left that throne to come here. To live that perfect sinless life. To shed his blood at Calvary's cross for us. To raise again from the dead. To seal our salvation. And now ascended back to heaven, he now sits there on that right hand throne again. Interceding for us as our great high priest. Isaiah tells us that his ways and thoughts are not ours. His thoughts and ways are higher than ours. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. My ways are not your ways, saith the Lord. Neither are my thoughts your thoughts. God is not a man that he may be influenced. God is a sovereign. Who rules his will and his way according to his plan. We see his reach. We see also the righteousness in verse number three. The song of the seraphims there in verse three. It's the same song that was sung by the four beasts in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The earth is full of his glory. The Hebrew word here means sacred. And in a world where nothing seems to be sacred, our Lord is. The most sacred. He is a three times holy God. In Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8, that word holy there in the Greek means also sacred with the thoughts of purity and moral blamelessness. When the angels expressed their praise to the Lord, they did so fervently. This was the subject they loved to dwell on and loved to harp on and they hated to leave. They could praise and express the holiness of God for eternity. And they do. They express the superlative excellence of God's holiness. Above that, all of the purest creatures. God is holy. He is thrice holy. He is infinitely holy. Originally holy. Perfectly and eternally holy. The glory of the Lord, the Bible says, filled the house. 
The voice of the Lord's holiness shook the house. The door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. When Isaiah saw this, and saw this vision of the Lord, he bowed humbly. Then said I, in verse number five, woe is me, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. If God were to show you a vision like that, would you react the same way? This is quite a scene. Isaiah saw that he was unclean, that he was undone. That word undone means destroyed. To be judged and punished by the Almighty God for his sin. And what are the wages of sin, the Bible says? Death. Isaiah's breath was taken away. His thought was, I will surely die. If God would deal with me in his strict justice because of Isaiah's unclean lips. Isaiah was a sinner. He had offended the Lord in, in word. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In James chapter 3 and verse number 2, James chapter 3 and verse 2, James 3 and verse 2, For in many things we offend all. But if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and is able to bridle his whole body. Speaking of the tongue. How many of us have not offended in word? Anyone here? I thought not. Because we all have at one time or another. We've all said things. That we wish we could take back. We've all communicated unclean words from an unclean heart. So as Isaiah is, we are unworthy to praise the Lord. in such a sinful state. And as, I, as Isaiah reflects on the angel's praise of the Lord as the Holy One, he sees his sin as unclean. When you compare your life how good you are or compare your life as a believer and get a status report of your Christian growth who do you compare your life to do you compare it to someone else do I compare my life with brother Dennis Do I compare my Christian life with Brother Dennis's Christian life? For example, 
The answer to that question is no. Because if I compared my Christian life with Brother Dennis's Christian life, then I would probably feel guilty all the time. Because I think Brother Dennis has everything together. Yeah, I know. I know we do. I know we do. An upstanding Christian man, Brother Dennis. And I fall short. So I would be guilty and I'd feel guilty all the time. But maybe if I compare myself with a Christian who's struggling in their faith and say, I'm not struggling like that, I must be doing pretty good. See what happens? I rationalize my position depending on who I compare myself with. I'm not to compare myself among men, among others. My standard of comparison is the Lord, high and lifted up. My goal is to be like Christ. That's my standard. That's your standard if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is your standard. Not people. And as I see my life compared with Christ, woe is me, for I am undone. Isaiah also dwelt with the people of unclean lips. So their unclean lips probably rubbed off on him. That's what happens, you know, as Christians walk in the world. We tend to stand by the mud puddle of sin and then the car drives by. And splashes it all over us. As we walk through this world of sin, we tend to get dirty. That's why it's good for us to confess our sins. And to have them cleansed. On a daily basis. So we can walk with the Lord with a good and clear conscience and be clean. Isaiah had seen the king, the Lord of hosts. He saw the sovereignty. Which is uncontestable. He is king, and his power is irresistible. These comfortable truths for the people of God should strike us in a sense of awe. We should have a reverence and godly fear in our life. But in our world today, as Paul said in Romans chapter 3, there is no fear of God. Even among those who profess to know God as their Savior, there's no fear of God. And we need to fear the one who can take our body and soul and cast it into hell. We need to live our life with that awe and that reverence, that respect of who God is. I respected my mother. I respected my mother all the days of her life. That little four foot and three quarter, four foot eleven and three quarter inch woman, even in her seventies, could take this five foot seven son who weighed almost two hundred pounds, pick him up and throw him through a wall if she needed to. I had a respect and a fear of my mother all my life. Because I knew if she needed to do that, she could do that. Should be the same way with God. The God that can bless us and the God that can correct us. Same God. But it depends on how we walk. Whether we get 
the carrot or the stick. Sometimes God has to use the stick. And we need to realize that. We must realize the distance between us and the Lord and our vileness and sinfulness before him. And be afraid of his great displeasure in our life. Because we are destroyed. As Isaiah says, if there's not a mediator between us and the Holy God. But thank God the Bible says that there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. High and lifted up upon his throne. Our great high priest interceding for us. Before the throne of God. See, Isaiah was now humbled and he was prepared to follow his calling as a prophet. People who are fitted... To be employed in the service of the Lord are those who are humble in their own eyes. Who are deeply sensible to their own weakness and unworthiness. To serve the Lord. I'm not worthy to do what I do. In fact, I'm far from it. I've been called by God to do what I do, yes. But I didn't merit it. It wasn't that I was on my knees since I was a boy saying, Lord, pick me, pick me, pick me. I'm unworthy to do this. I'm unworthy to proclaim the word of God. I'm unworthy to witness to others. I'm unworthy of the salvation that the Lord gives me by grace through faith. And I can't do this alone. For I am weak. Therefore, I need the Lord to help me do what he has called me to do that I am so unworthy of doing. Of being a Christian. I'm so unworthy of that title. But yet the Lord, by his grace, saved my soul when I asked him to do so. He did it. I wasn't worthy of it, but he did it. I'm not worthy to be called a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he called me. And therefore, he has equipped me to do the job that I need to do. God has saved you and God has called you. A ministry and a purpose for your life. You may not be worthy of it, and you can't do it alone in your own strength. That's humbling. The only way we can be a Christian is to depend on the Lord to see us through. The angel took his tongs there and took a coal off the altar. The angel put it in his hand and he put it on Isaiah's lips and the fire purified the lips of the prophet. The explanation here of this sign is that Isaiah's hearts and lips have been cleansed by the Lord. The guilt of his sin is removed by the Lord's pardoning mercy including the guilt of the sins of his tongue, so are ours. His corrupt disposition to sin in his heart is removed by the Lord's renewing grace, and so is ours. 
Because of this, nothing could hinder Isaiah from being accepted as a worshiper of God and a messenger of God to mankind. It's the same with us who have given ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Only those who have purged their conscience are ready to serve the Lord. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. Hebrews 9 and verse 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The Lord then calls Isaiah to service there in verse number 8. The Lord God, that I, whom Isaiah saw high and lifted up, he deliberates in advising with himself, as he did in creation. In Genesis 1 and verse 26, he said, before he created man, let us make man in our own image, after our own likeness. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? The Trinity represented there of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, who will go for us? God does for this for us, not that he needs to do this. But he does it for our sake. And Isaiah answers the question. He says, here am I. Send me. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? I will. Why would he volunteer to do that? Because he had seen the Lord high and lifted up on his throne, in his glory, the holy God that had cleansed him from his sin, that had saved his immortal soul. He said, I'll serve you. You've done all this for me. I'll serve you. So let me ask this morning, do you have a clear and true picture of who the Lord Jesus Christ is in your heart and life? Some don't. Some think of him as the man upstairs. You know the man upstairs? Sometimes I talk to the man upstairs. Isn't that so disrespectful? Or they think of him as an elderly grandfather. Or that uncle that comes to visit, came to visit when you were kids, and you know, here's 50 cents. Go to the movies. Just generous, give and give and give all the time. God is not that way either. Our Lord is not that way either. Do you know, you see, if you do, then whatever the Lord would tell you to do in his word, you would do. 
You would respond as Isaiah responded to the vision he saw of the Lord high and lifted up. You would be humbled. And when the Lord called you to do something as he does in his word for every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll do it. Willingly. Without complaint. Man, I got to go to church today. Oh, man. Well, I'm glad that, I'm glad the Chiefs game was postponed because, you know, that bastard he just. Sometimes we serve the Lord kicking and screaming. I don't want to do this. Don't make me do this. I don't want to do this. When it should be, Lord, you've done so much for me. You laid down your life to pay the penalty of my sin and what I've done against you. I should be willing to give my life to serve you. It's the reasonable thing to do. It's the best thing to do. But would you worship the Lord in his house? Read and study his word, pray, witness, live a pure, separated life for the Lord Jesus Christ? See, let's refocus our vision on the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is. And if we get that true picture, it will give us a true picture of who we are. And put life in perspective of what we need to do for our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand together as we sing the verse of invitation. Appreciate your time and attention this morning.